Leila Aliva is one of the President of Azerbaijan's daughters. She's an artist and a socialite, kind of like Kim Kardashian, but with a more powerful family. She owns a £17 million house in London, hangs out with royalty and was married to a pop star. But Leila enjoys a lot more freedom and luxury than some of her fellow citizens. Government critics in Azerbaijan face arrest and imprisonment. Peaceful protesters have been tear-gassed and beaten, and journalists face severe punishment, sometimes including torture and death. This is in their own words, and today we hear from one particular journalist who exposed some of the corruption behind Leila's family wealth and the secret to her charmed life. For this, she was punished in a uniquely cruel and humiliating way. This is Khadija Ismailova, and this is her story. I grew up in a family that was one of the well-doing families in the Soviet Union. My father was a member of parliament. He was a respected person. Both mother and father were very outspoken. When National Liberation Movement started, my father was communist. My mother was in opposition. I was 13 when I started the first youth organization together with friends in our school and other schools. So the movement was about liberating the country from the Soviet Union to get rid of communism. My father was a member of Soviet parliament and uh, there was a time when he was inside the parliament and his daughters were outside of the parliament protesting. But my father was tolerant to the opposition in the family. It's a proud part of my life because I think I was on the right cause, even if I was a kid. There was a lot of fear in Soviet times. People were very frightened, scared to talk about ideology, identity, religion, things that totalitarian regime was trying to put his grip on. But they were more outspoken about criticizing their managers, criticizing people in the government even. If you don't touch the ideology, there were more freedom of expression. Now, you can speak about ideology, you can speak about your identity, but I live now in the country where the fear is the ruling force. Most of the people are very scared to criticize the government. I wanted to be a journalist or historian. It was like different ideas came at different times when I started as a journalist, it was first social news, some general reporting. And I was switching from Azerbaijan language newspaper to Russian language newspaper, English language newspaper. So it was like a mix of languages and uh, topics. Then I became a political news editor at the newspaper. It was about politics, but it wasn't investigative. In 2005, Elmar Husseinov was the first one who was writing about the family wealth of Aliyevs. He was the only one speaking about the corruption on the top echelons of the ruling regime. He was killed in 2005. He was killed in the entrance of his apartment, five bullets in his mouth. The very fact that Elmar Hussainov was shot in his mouth was saying that it was to silence him. That was quite descriptive. And there was a silence and nobody was writing about the family for many years. Elmar Hussainov was the bravest. We have to respect. Uh, we have to respect. And uh, we have to be reminded that part of the blame for his death is on our shoulders. He was killed because the government knew that he's the only one. 
and by silencing him, they will silence many. For a couple years, there were not even columns about Aliyev's family. In 2005, when Elmar Hussainov was killed, and I saw the pictures of his son kissing the portrait of his dead father. Then I decided that I'm not going to have any family, I'm not going to get married. You don't want to harm more people. You don't want to create more bounds than you have, so these bounds could be used by the government. That was a decision made back then. But I had a relationship with the guy and the government used it against me. In 2009, American journalist from Washington Post called me saying that he needs help with fixing some issues with investigation about Dubai property of President Ilham Aliyev's children. And that was wow. We knew that they have a lot of money, but we didn't think about the scope. After the story was published, it was a blast effect. I was running the talk show and every single government representative or member of parliament who would come to the show would face the question like, do you know about Dubai property? Have you read the story? And what do you think? Are you going to question the government about it? It was like a eye-opening experiences as well. It occurred to me that it's possible to obtain documents when it's needed and if you try well. So I started investigations. One of the stories was about the bank that was privatized, the company president's wife and the country's president's daughter privatized the bank, bypassing the privatization procedures. When we wrote the story, it was again a blast effect because It was the first time when Azerbaijani journalist was referring to documents and verifying every single fact in the story. It was like uh, establishing a new standard. And then I started looking for offshore information. And this is when my Panama Papers started. It was the story that revealed that 72% of the mobile phone company belonged to the president's daughters. In 2009, when the Dubai property story came out, we had some tough conversations with some government representatives, but it wasn't as tough because at the end of the day, it was Washington Post story. It wasn't ours. And in 2010, when we published the story about Silkway Bank, then we got a phone call saying, do I want to be dealt with? I just ignored it. I just ignored it. And in 2011, when I published the story about the Panama company of president's family, that was, uh, that was a difficult time. There were always attacks on TV and in newspapers against me. And I knew that I'm being watched and I'm being tapped. I'm sending them questions with the details of the story to respond. Why would I hide? They started propaganda on me being a loose woman. And then this blackmail started. It was March 7th and I received the envelope with the pictures of me and my boyfriend in my bedroom. In the envelope, there were several pictures uh, of me uh, in the bedroom with my boyfriend. It was quite intimate scene. And um, the small note saying that, whore, behave, or you will be defamed. So that was the message. And uh, it was clear. It was clear. 
that was the most difficult couple hours of my life because I had tough conversation with my brother who actually took his knife and came to kill me because that was the tradition requires him to do he first he didn't understand the political side of it he was angry that I have I was in relationship he had his knife in his hand and he said tell me it's a montage and I kept saying that it's nobody's business and yeah that was a difficult time my brother was calmed down by my friend Shahvalat he's a journalist as well because I called him and he actually already knew because the copy of the envelope went to some newspapers he came to support and he calmed down my brother so I owe him my life maybe that was that was tough and I think that was a strongest weapon they could use against me but they did a mistake they used it in the very beginning after what happened then nothing does matter nothing I'm not scared of arrest I'm not scared of being killed I'm not scared of being beaten because being exposed in your bedroom is the worst thing that may happen to women in Azerbaijan. I didn't do anything that was shameful. I'm a free woman and my boyfriend was adult and he wasn't married, I, I wasn't married. That's considered wrong in Azerbaijan, being in relationship with, without being married. I decided that I go public with this threat I decided that I will not show any weakness and when it came I can tell you the anger was bigger than fear maybe that's one of the rare cases when anger helps you to make a right decision but on the day of the envelope I had daily show to run that day the decision to make it public and not to step back I didn't even think twice. I called my manager in radio and he said uh, maybe I should take a day off not to go to the radio. I said no, I'm gonna go and run my show as if nothing happened. I will publish the threat after the show just to avoid questions during the live show. Then I came to the show and uh, the only person in the office I told was my producer. I told him what happened and I told him to be ready to back up if something happens to me during the show. He was in, he was in shock. Basically, it disabled him from working that day. Uh, and when I listen back to that show, I'm proud that I didn't show anything. I didn't even show any anger or any suffering or any emotion. Later that day in the evening, my mother called me. I didn't respond to any phone calls till the evening, but uh, in the evening she called me. She said, why did this happen? And she said she will always support me. And then she had a conversation with my brother and uh, she Mother, mother was supportive from the very first minute. It means a lot when your mother is backing you at no matter what. It means a lot. And uh, it's great that she is like she is. My boyfriend's reaction was that he will be by my side all the time and uh, he will be, but he was scared. I didn't want to harm him more because uh, he, he was exposed as well. He didn't choose my profession. He didn't choose all the risks I did. I decided to get separated from him right away. Yeah. And a week later, the video was uploaded 
then the trolls started writing me nasty things. The newspapers of the government started writing nasty stuff about describing what they saw in the video, what a loose woman I am, and uh, why nobody would kill me, and all this stuff. It turned out that all the newspapers that was, were writing this nasty stuff were somehow linked to ruling party. They've been calculating, I think, that I might be killed for that, or people will not respect me anymore, or I will step back myself. None of this happened. None of this happened. I decided that I shouldn't step back and I do more work, so they understand that it's useless. They have to understand that blackmailing and intrusion to privacy is not the way to silence people. After the blackmail, I did four more investigations on family wealth of Aliyevs. So I published all the investigations. I've been doing the Daily Show on radio, and it was the most outspoken radio program. It was critical and it was popular. So there were a lot of reasons for the government not to like me. I was in Warsaw when I received a phone call saying a person from the pro-government media said that they have a solid information that I will be arrested when I come back. I made it again public. I said, I'm coming back. Don't expect me to, to run away or to leave my country because the country is ours and we have to take care of it. In December 2014, Khadija Ismailova smiled and waved at supporters as she was taken into pre-trial detention. She has described the Azerbaijani government as a repression machine and her incarceration has been condemned by Western governments and human rights groups. Friends and relatives of investigative journalist Khadija Ismailova waited outside a court in Baku as a judge handed down a guilty verdict on charges including libel, tax evasion and abuse of power. Ismailova reported on corruption involving President Ilham Aliyev and other Azerbaijani officials. International right groups have condemned the charges as politically motivated retaliation for Ismailova's reporting. The court sentenced Ismailova to seven and a half years in prison. I had visitors in pretrial and in prison asking if I would agree to slow down or to stop. I said, no, I'm not going to stop. And I was proving it by writing stories from prison. The only woman prison is prison number four, and that's a problem because women don't criticize. They are silent because there is no other prison. There was violence against prisoners. The facility was not big enough for the number of prisoners it had. There were only 10 toilets for 470 people. There was no shower. There were buckets with water to take a bath. People were living in very bad conditions and uh, it created a lot of conflicts. So it was, it was an experience. <laughs> You have to live with these people for many months. So the first rule was not to judge them. There were people who sold drugs, who used drugs, who came with a fraud charge. A lot of those charged with robbery. One was charged with human trafficking. Another was charged with killing someone. And um, 
I didn't judge. I knew that they arrested me to stop my writing and uh, the best way to show that it was a wrong decision was to continue writing from prison. That's what I did. I, uh, I was writing and smuggling letters from prison. After every story, I had a search in the cell. I was incarcerated once and a lot of reprimands. I was strip searched before every meeting with lawyer, family, going to court. They were very puzzled with how did I smuggle the letters while I was strip searched. There are a lot of ways, a lot of ways to do that. They are just not smart enough. So, <laughs> whatever the problems in prison are, it's important to show that they don't bother you. Because our government act like rapist maniacs. If you resist or if you suffer, they enjoy it and they continue. So that was my strategy. I had three tools with me. Humor, humor, humor. Whatever would happen, I would make it a joke. When I was incarcerated after one of the articles, after 24 hours in carcer, they uh, took me to the pretrial detentions chief. And when I entered the room, I said, if you have an idea to get me out of the carcer, please don't do that because I like it there. Because in our cell, we don't see any stars or moon. We don't see any trees, but I can see it from the window of the incarceration cell. I was showing that it doesn't bother me. I really enjoy the punishments and so on. For almost two months, we didn't have anything to heat our food. Basically, six people in the cell were suffering because of me. We didn't have any tool for heating the food. The chief guard, she would take me out and say, Look, you are suffering there with the cold food. The chief says, if she stops writing, then we will give her a heater. And I said, I like cold food. So, so that was the, basically, that was the strategy. I was singing all the time. And uh, even in, when I was incarcerated, I was singing there. And it was like opera singing. I was singing in the court, I was smiling all the time, I was telling jokes, I was trying to be helpful. I was trying to make as much as possible from this uh, experience. That was always a strategy. Like my main message all the time is that if they throw stones at you, gather them, collect them and build the house. I think I managed it because um, the work didn't stop while I was in prison. My writings didn't stop. I became a stronger person and the government got even more criticism than it could get from me. And this is the key. I think it's important not to show that you are suffering. It's, of course there were problems. Of course there were uh, things that was difficult to endure. And it wasn't just about cold food. There were things that you don't want to remember and you don't want to talk to yourself about it. In prison, you try to get rid of the good memories of the life in freedom. Because comparing the life in reality with the life in your memories makes your life difficult. After prison, I'm trying to get rid of the memories of prison because uh, there are things that I would rather forget. And it's very easy to control them during the daytime, but very difficult to control the dreams. They come in dreams. I was 11 months in pre-trial detention and then six and a half months in uh, the prison, number four. 
I was going to sit there for seven and a half years. I started studying Spanish. I had long-term plans for seven and a half years. The campaign for my freedom was spinning up and in May they had to release me. Basically, they had no other choice. I was surprised. I was surprised. I was, I was not ready. I was not ready and I was kind of a frozen when the prison chief told me that I'm getting released. I said, why, how? And he was like, are you not glad? It was just like a, something I didn't plan. The first thing in mind was that, oh, my Spanish books, because I've been sharing them with another prison mate. The small details, they overwhelmed me. Then I left and uh, I was expecting that they will smuggle me from the prison because they didn't want any loud ceremony. I wasn't smuggled. I left from the front door and smiling, smiling, happy. Yeah, freedom is better than prison. Smiling broadly, RFERL journalist Khadija Ismailova walked free from prison in the Azerbaijani capital, Baku. She told the waiting reporters she'd spent 537 days behind bars on trumped-up charges. Reporters in Azerbaijan are still frequently harassed, beaten and blackmailed. Journalism remains a dangerous profession. The remainder of Khadija's sentence has now been suspended by Azerbaijan's Supreme Court. She has vowed to continue her work. Well, readjustment was, is difficult actually, it keeps going on. As soon as I got out of prison, the work started the next day. And now there, there's no office of the radio, so you work from home. And you basically sit in front of your computer in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Because they don't let me out of the country, even attending the conferences now is on in front of the computer. So I give all the interviews and attend all the events via Skype. So I'm growing to hate my computer. <laughs> and I'm sitting here, people were expecting me to publish investigations like the next day after the prison and it's much more difficult now to verify facts in Azerbaijan too because the access to information is much more limited now than it was before. By keeping me inside the country they are not preventing me from attending the events but they want me to suffer. Well, I'm not. I'm not suffering. I'm always hopeful about the future. There is a lot of work to do. Maybe I'm not a result-oriented person. I'm doing what I'm doing because this is the right thing to do and uh, it would be wrong not to do it. That was Khadija Ismailova. Khadija continues to work as a journalist in Azerbaijan despite the huge personal risks. She won't have attained justice until her conviction is quashed. Azerbaijan is one of the worst offenders for censoring the press, but it's a tried and tested means of repression for governments around the world and something we always speak out against. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate us on iTunes, leave a review and subscribe to the series on your podcast provider if you don't already. If you want to find out more about Khadija and how to campaign for people like her, go to our website, amnesty.org.uk forward slash words. Thanks for listening. I'm Anna Baccarelli and the series producer is Sam Lawler. Next episode, we hear about a corruption scandal closer to home in the UK and the huge human rights campaign that followed. See you then.